Hello, I'm Roger Mudd. Welcome to the History Channel. What is it that causes people to betray their country? Is it money? Is it politics? Is it the challenge of beating the system? Or is it the excitement of living on the edge? Whatever the motive, in the 1980s, there seemed to be an epidemic of traitors who had access to America's deepest secrets and who sold them to the Soviet Union. Our program looks at four traitors, one from the Navy, one from the FBI, one from the CIA, one from the NSA. Join us now as the History Channel presents Traitors Within the Deadliest Decade. The intelligence community in assessing damage spied on the Soviet KGB and received a million dollars. Spying has been called the second oldest profession in the world. 1985 would become known as the year of the spy, when four Americans committed treason. Every time you caught one, it was worse than the one before. More astounding was the fact that they worked for four different intelligence agencies. Each of these agencies never believed their own people would turn against them. The breadth of the penetration and the damage done to naval and military operations, the loss of top secret codes, and the execution of our own spies in Russia were catastrophic. Collectively, the damage is absolutely obscene and could have been disastrous at any time that we had the war. In the early 80s, the Cold War had reached a critical stage. Tensions had ratcheted up between the Soviet Union and the United States. President Reagan called for a moral crusade against the Soviets, calling them the evil empire. To protect against the threat of nuclear war, Reagan proposed a missile defense system that became known as Star Wars. I think this led to a great deal of the tension that existed between the Soviet Union and the United States at that time. And it certainly led, as we now know, to a war scare in Moscow about what Reagan's intentions uh, actually were. The Soviet leadership uh, was uh, truly scared by President Reagan's uh, new policies. They considered these policies uh, as aggressive, uh, militaristic, and war th uh, fraught with danger of real war. As fear and distrust escalated on both sides, the invisible war of spy versus spy intensified. The Soviets were determined to learn America's secrets. Now they admit they weren't having much luck recruiting American spies. But as luck would have it, they wouldn't need any. Americans with access to top secret and classified information were offering to spy for the Soviets for a price. They were walking in off the streets, offering themselves, providing classified information up front, and receiving money in return and the promise of more money. These spies weren't motivated by a fervent belief in communism, like the spies of the 40s and 50s, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and Rudolf Abel. These spies were motivated by the oldest temptations in the book, money and sex, and sometimes revenge. The first spy to be revealed in 1985 was Richard Miller, an FBI agent. It was the first time in history that the FBI had arrested one of their own for espionage. Before Richard Miller came along, the idea that an agent of the FBI could be disloyal to his country was inconceivable. Now it isn't. Miller, a 20-year veteran of the FBI, was a far cry from James Bond, or television's version of an FBI agent, as even his lawyer admitted. He was certainly no Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., and he was, in fact, uh, much closer to an overweight Inspector Clouseau. Miller had been chastised by the agency for being obese and for selling Amway products out of the trunk of his car. He was viewed as a loser by most of his fellow agents. At age 47, Miller's private life was in shambles. In 1983, he had been excommunicated from the Mormon church for committing adultery and was separated from his wife and eight children. I wasn't successful in my religion. I wasn't successful in my marriage, although I consider myself a good father, and I wasn't very successful at work. 
So come May of 1984, uh, I'm sort of like a glob of silly putty waiting to be uh, molded into whatever fashion anybody wants me to. In 1984, Miller's FBI job in counterintelligence included keeping tabs on Russian emigres in the Los Angeles area. He'd been given a job that uh, was supposed to be least likely to get him into trouble. And that's where he met a woman who persuaded him to do the things that he did. In the course of doing his job, Miller met Svetlana Ogorodnikova, a striking Russian emigre who lived in L.A. with her husband and young son. She claimed to be a distributor of Soviet films, but the FBI learned she had close ties to KGB agents. Soon, their friendly chats over coffee turned into long afternoons at the beach in Malibu and Tris at Svetlana's apartment in Hollywood while her husband was at work. He had been compromised by a uh, Soviet Matahari. After a few weeks, her pillow talk turned to persuasion as she convinced Miller to trade classified secrets to the Russians for money. Svetlana contacted the Russian consulate in San Francisco and set up a meeting. Miller brought along an FBI foreign intelligence manual offering to sell it for $15,000 in cash and $50,000 in gold. The Soviets were interested and proposed a second meeting with the KGB in Vienna, Austria. OK, they're both in her car and they're driving away. But the FBI had been tipped off by an informant about the couple's visit to the Russian consulate. I can't really detail how he was found. I think some of that's still classified. But his credentials showed up on, in, on some documents we were able to obtain uh, by uh, sensitive means. And uh, it didn't take long. And this is your heart, right? Yeah. Taking my heart. The FBI began surveillance on each of them and tapped Svetlana's phone. On October 3rd, before their imminent trip to Vienna, Miller and Svetlana were arrested. When questioned by the FBI, this rather pathetic wannabe spy broke down. Miller defended himself claiming he was trying to demonstrate his value to the FBI by setting himself up as a double agent to spy on the Russians. It was a last-ditch effort to save his career. My overriding uh, emphasis was, hey, Richard, you're in trouble with your job. This is your last chance to save your career and so forth. So I pulled all the stops, and nothing would deter me from my objective of trying to get myself back into good graces because I only had it a couple of years before I would have retired. The jury didn't buy Miller's story and found him guilty. Richard Miller was sentenced to two life terms plus 50 years. The sentence on appeal was reduced to 20 years in prison. Svetlana received 18 years and continued to deny she was a modern day Matahari. I'm not guilty of this crime. Like I say, they accused Matahari before, 100 years ago. Now they say she's not guilty. She's helped to friends. <laughs> I'm not guilty of this crime. After Miller's arrest, many wondered why he hadn't been fired by the FBI years ago. A lot of people early on didn't want to look at it hard and long and with a kind of critical eye that is necessary in order to clean it up. I don't regard the, uh, the Miller case as being a particularly damaging case for uh, the country, but it was a real jolt to the FBI to think that uh, one of their own would behave in that way. The intelligence community seemed to view this as an isolated case. But the next spy arrested in 1985 would prove how disastrous a mistake that could be. Since World War II, the United States has had the largest and most powerful Navy in the world, or so we thought. But in 1985, when former Navy man John Walker and his ring of spies were arrested, the government was astonished to discover 
that the naval fleet had been systematically sabotaged for 18 years. The most damaging thing they really did was to provide the, the Russians with real hard data on how good our submarines were. Command battle stations missile or PEM launch. And enabled for a long period the Soviets to know exactly where all of our submarines were at any given time. If war had broken out, thousands and thousands of American kids would have, would have died as a result of that. John Walker Jr. began his espionage career in 1967 when he was a Navy radio man in Norfolk, Virginia, at the largest Navy base in the world. In his job, he had access to coded messages between the fleet's ships and submarines and the Navy Command Center. Most damaging, he had access to key lists used to decipher the Navy's top secret encryption codes. 30-year-old Walker was in debt. He needed money and knew how to get it quickly selling secrets to the Soviets. The motivation was not uh, complex, it was pure greed. In late 1967, he traveled to Washington, D.C., walked into the Soviet embassy, and offered his services as a spy. John Walker was a walk-in. He was one of those volunteers uh, who came to the Russian embassy, Soviet embassy, in my time. In 1967, Oleg Kalugin was then the KGB officer stationed at the Soviet embassy in Washington. He would supervise Walker's meetings with his KGB handlers. Had the military conflict erupted between the two superpowers at the time, the compromised cryptographic material provided by John Walker would have had war-winning implications for the Soviet side. Eventually, Walker provided the Soviets with the keys to the kingdom compromising U.S. naval forces, including the strategic superiority of nuclear submarines, an incredible coup for the Soviets. Walker gave the Soviets daily code settings for the KL-47 encryption machine that encoded and decoded top secret messages for the American fleet. Using the key list provided by Walker, they could decipher the most highly classified communications of the U.S. Navy. If we intercept the orders coming from Washington, even before the United States launches, we have a, an opportunity to make a preemptive strike, which would make America indeed in a very bad situation. During that same time, the United States was waging a fierce war in Vietnam. The classified information Walker gave to the Soviets enabled them to pass along U.S. naval communications to the North Vietnamese. They provided to the North Vietnamese uh, the uh, secret daily codes uh, for our aviators as to where they would be going, which targets would get hit, what the rules of engagement were, so that it enabled the North Vietnamese to emplace their anti-aircraft weapons and to set up traps for the American aircraft. And as a result, a lot of airmen died because of, uh, because of that during the, uh, during the Vietnam War. In 1976, after spying for nine years, Walker retired from the Navy with the rank of Warrant Officer III. Not the most prestigious rank in the Navy, but he knew the Soviets ranked him number one as a spy. He started his own private investigation firm in Virginia Beach. But Walker wanted to keep his lucrative spy business going. So he enlisted the help of his brother, Arthur, and his friend, Jerry Whitworth, both Navy men with access to classified information. The same year, he divorced his wife, Barbara, who moved to Massachusetts with their three daughters. His son, Michael, chose to live with the father he idolized. I had a closer relationship with my father. I was more like him. I wanted to be like him. John Walker, flush with money, was leading the high life. He bought a plane and houseboat, partied heavily, and had lots of women. I liked the way he dressed. I liked his cars. I liked his boats, his house, his women. Well, we were more than just father and son. We were very good friends. Walker was setting the stage for Michael to take over the lucrative spy business when he retired. Yeah, I was 
burning out at that point and and looking to get out of it completely just just retire and quit he talked michael into enlisting in the navy and specializing in communications eventually michael was assigned to the uss nimitz as a radio man which fell right into his father's plans joined the navy like he had done did all the things in the navy he had done basically and it just there was a pattern everything was pointing in that direction there was no avoiding it at, at a certain point it was to the point of no return amazingly on board the nimitz michael without having security clearance had no trouble getting access to and stealing hundreds of classified documents which he dutifully handed over to his father michael hid the documents under his pillow and simply walked off the nimitz with them in his duffel bag he was never searched incredibly Walker and his spy ring went undetected for 18 years, from 1967 to 1985. The Soviets had paid him close to $2 million. He was considered their number one spy. What a wonderful thing for a person who's having a rather mediocre career to be looking in the mirror each morning and saying, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the most famous the most uh, dramatic, the most heroic spy of them all. And to know that while your bosses think you're a mediocrity, uh, you know you're the most important spy that the Soviets have ever recruited. What finally brought Walker down? It wasn't naval intelligence. The Navy never suspected spies in their midst. The tip that led to Walker's arrest came from a much closer source, Walker's ex-wife. She had known about Walker's espionage and even accompanied him on some of his dead drops to the Soviets. I prayed he would be caught. I also prayed that he would stop. I knew there was nothing I could say that would stop him. Barbara never knew that her son, Michael, was spying for her ex-husband. I couldn't tell her because I was afraid it would hurt her and that maybe she might try something like killing herself, my father, or uh, just going off the deep end. I was really afraid for that. In November 1984, Barbara's daughter Laura told her mother that when she was in the army, her father had tried to enlist her as a spy. Outraged, Barbara finally worked up the courage to call the FBI, but they had a hard time believing her story. Barbara. Um told this fantastic story. But one FBI agent, Joe Wolfinger, in Norfolk, Virginia, did believe her. Apparently, Barbara Walker had accompanied him to Washington to uh, fill a drop, clear a drop. Uh, she described that in a way in which I did not think a uh, disgruntled, uh, vindictive former wife would be able to describe an espionage uh, 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 transaction. She talked about uh, seeing signals, leaving a drop at a particular place. It really had too much rich detail to be completely disregarded. So on that, uh, those facts, we opened a case. Wolfinger had no idea that the investigation would reveal a spy who many still believe to be the most damaging in American history. On February 25th, 1985, the FBI officially opened the case on John Walker. But to convict him, they would have to catch him in the act of making a drop to the Soviets. At this point, the FBI had never caught a spy in the act. The FBI tapped his phones at his home in Norfolk, Virginia, and his private investigation firm. They hoped for a clue, a hint of an upcoming delivery to the Soviets. In the meantime, they learned a bit about his personality from listening to his phone calls. He would lie when the truth would serve him better. Um, he was totally self-centered. The FBI tapped Walker's phones for a month, and finally it paid off on May 16, 1985. They overheard a telephone call that sounded suspicious. And it was his mother uh, telling him that his favorite aunt had, uh, as she said, cashed in her chips, meaning, of course, that she had died. 
and John's mom wanted him to come up to Pennsylvania and attend the funeral. And he begged off and said that he just he couldn't come. He had something to do that no one else could do. Well, as an investigator, uh, that raises my, my antennae. That weekend, Joe Wolfinger and FBI investigator Bob Hunter ordered surveillance teams and a helicopter to cover Walker's comings and goings. That Sunday, Walker came out, packed his van with a duffel bag, and backed out of his driveway. The FBI hoped this was the real thing and not a wild goose chase. So now we're heading to DC. It's getting very exciting at this point. As they reached the state line, Wolfinger and Hunter turned it over to another FBI team while they went to the FBI headquarters in DC to monitor the chase. Wolfinger and I were in the command center about 20 minutes, I guess, when the words that you never want to hear on surveillance came piping through the radio. Anybody have the eyeball? We've lost them. So we agonized there in that command center for four hours. We didn't know where John was. Finally, they picked up sight of Walker's Chevy Astro van again at 7.45 p.m. Everything was wonderful. It was a wonderful day once again. And uh, the spirits were high, and we were hard on the task uh, immediately. They followed Walker to an intersection in the backcountry roads of Maryland. The Soviets had prepared obsessively detailed maps for Walker, as well as photos of the signal and drop sites. Walker got out of his car at a stop sign and placed a 7-up can under it and left. It was a signal to his KGB contact that he would make a drop later that night. Walker drove off, and the FBI continued its tight surveillance. At about 8.30, he stopped uh, under a tree, uh, got out of his van, uh, put something down on the ground, and we could see that. After Walker left the scene, the FBI rushed in. Agents found a brown paper bag filled with bottles and junk but buried under the garbage were reams of classified documents. One of the agents came on the radio and there was some excitement and he said, I've got it, I've got it, I can see it. It's got secret stuff in it. And at that point, we had an almost perfect espionage case against John Walker. When the agents searched the bag, they found 129 classified documents from the USS Nimitz, where Michael Walker was assigned. They had the evidence. Now they needed the spy. They followed Walker back to the Ramada Inn in Rockville, Maryland, room 763. He was signed in under an assumed name, John A. Johnson. At 3.30 a.m., an FBI agent posing as a desk clerk called Walker in his room. Mr. Johnson, uh, you driving a Chevy Astro van, licensed so-and-so? Would you mind coming down to the desk? Uh, someone just ran into it, and uh, we need to, you know, talk to the police, get the insurance, whatever. Uh, and of course, when when he comes out, we're going to effect the arrest. Bob Hunter and his partner were ready to nab him as he reached the elevator. We knew that we had probably the biggest spy that there has ever been uh, in this country. So the adrenaline is really flowing, and the heart is, is going, and we are ready. Finally, they heard Walker's door open and close and saw him approach the elevator. As he reaches for the elevator button with his left hand, he heard us move, and he wheeled around with his gun on us. We were close enough that I could see the bullets in the cylinder of his revolver. You know how you hear things are slow motion in a, some situations? Well, that's what this was. And I'm watching him with this pistol in his hand, and I could see those bullets. <laughs> and it seemed like a long time before he finally did what we told him to, which, of course, was to drop the gun. 
John Walker's days as the perfect spy were over, and he would suffer another humiliation as well. As Kaluch is, is searching him, he reached up and grabbed that toupee and pulled it off John's head, and it made this loud <laughs> sucking noise, and he threw it on the floor, and I sort of laughed to myself. That was funny. In this period of high drama, that was, that was funny. In 1985, John Walker Jr. was sentenced to life imprisonment, as was his brother Arthur and his pal Jerry Whitworth. His son Michael received 25 years. Evidence at trial and evidence before the grand jury, testimony by distinguished intelligence and military experts, um, they said that Walker's espionage gave the Russians war-winning capability. Throughout his arrest and trial, Walker showed no remorse, excusing his actions by saying the Russians never could have won the war. I sold secrets to a country that we were not at war with and have never have been at war with and never will be at war with. That's all I'm saying. Don't make more of it than it is. But the Soviets had given Walker's secret codes to the North Vietnamese, who were at war with the U.S. I've always thought that John Walker is responsible for many of the widows that I knew in Virginia Beach who lost their husbands in Vietnam who were Navy, Navy pilots. He did some devastating things to this country. He put his, his comrades at risk and caused some of them to die. Uh, he has to live with that, but I don't have to like him. Walker's arrest was a major victory for the FBI, but the year wasn't over yet. Two more spies would be arrested in 1985, but they would be caught through information received from a surprising source, a Russian spymaster who was a colonel in the KGB. Aftershocks were still being felt following John Walker's arrest when another bombshell hit the intelligence community in the fall of 1985. It would come from a very reliable but surprising source, a senior officer in the KGB, Vitaly Yurchenko. On August 1st, 1985, Yurchenko visited Rome, contacted the American embassy, and asked for asylum. He claimed to want freedom and a better quality of life, but what he didn't mention was that he also hoped to reignite a love affair with the wife of the Russian ambassador, now in Canada. The next day, he was flown to Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington, D.C. It was a very festive atmosphere there. Uh, we certainly were looking forward to uh, getting a lot of information from uh, Yurchenko. The FBI and CIA started debriefing Yurchenko immediately at a safe house in Virginia. The first question is always, uh, do you know of any imminence of war? And then the second one usually is, and always is, is, is there somebody that uh, we should watch out for that you want to tell just the director of central intelligence? Uh, and the implication everybody knows that I think is that, is there a spy in the government? Yurchenko would astonish them when he told them not one, but two. He didn't know their names, but he described them and said one work for the CIA. Yurchenko said it's, uh, his name is Robert, which was his code name, and he's being trained to go to Moscow. Well, the CIA knew right away that was, had to be Edward Lee Howard. Edward Lee Howard had been one of the bright young Turks at the CIA. Before joining the agency in the 1970s, he had been with the Peace Corps in Colombia. In 1981, at 30, he applied for a job with the CIA. Only two years later, in 1983, he was chosen for a select post in Moscow. His job would be to recruit Russians to spy for the United States. He is selected from all the officers trained at the farm to be in Moscow. This is top gun for the agency. As part of his training, the CIA gave him detailed background information on the Russians spying for the United States. But at the 11th hour in April of 1983, only weeks before his departure to Moscow, he still had to take one more polygraph test. The CIA has great confidence in polygraphs. It's almost a uh, religious belief in the CIA. 
He had already admitted to the CIA that in his 20s he had taken drugs, including cocaine, and had done some heavy drinking. But this last polygraph showed deception on his part, a deception the CIA has never revealed. The CIA asked for his resignation. Howard was devastated. He's married, and uh, he has a, uh, a son just born. He's, they're getting ready to go. And suddenly, the rug is pulled out from under him. His whole world, his whole world collapses. After leaving the CIA, Howard moved his family to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and tried to pull his life together. He got a job with the state's finance committee as an economic analyst. Ed was a very hard worker. He was a very uh, capable analyst. He was highly thought of by not only the, the members of the legislative finance committee, but other legislators also. But underneath his pleasant demeanor, there was still a raging anger toward the CIA. And in Howard's mind, the way to get revenge was to give away what the agency valued most, intelligence. He definitely had a problem with alcohol. And uh, I think it was uh, probably one night while he was, uh, had a snootful, he contacted the Soviet consulate here in Washington and said, you know, I'm a CIA officer, I have secrets, I know what we do in Moscow, and uh, I'm available. You know, have, have secrets, we'll travel. In September 1984, on the pretext of going on a business trip, Howard went to Vienna, the international capital of spies. There he met for the first time with his Soviet contact. Howard gave him names of some Soviets working for the CIA, information he got while training for his aborted Moscow job. Any information that he was given by CIA headquarters, he passed on to the Soviets, and the Soviets are, are quite good at, uh, at analyzing the activities of the intelligence officers who are there. But Howard's greatest damage was revealing to the KGB the identity of a Russian scientist, Adolf Tolkachev. Adolf Tolkachev was involved in the stealth technology research for the Soviets, uh, aircraft design, uh, defense research. Tolkachev was immediately arrested by the KGB and executed. The CIA had no idea Howard was responsible for Tolkachev's arrest until Yurchenko defected and described the traitor in their midst. Because he had been such a loose cannon after his dismissal, the CIA was certain that Edward Lee Howard was the spy Yurchenko described. But still, they waited valuable days before informing the FBI. If he had gone into the embassy, uh, if we had seen him, uh, there would have been action that we could have taken at that time. So why they did not tell us, uh, I don't know. The CIA knew they should have shared their concerns about Howard sooner. But there was a long-standing animosity and distrust between these two agencies. They never get along. They are like kids in a sandbox, kicking sand in each other's faces. And then when mommy or daddy comes along, they pretend they're playing nice. Five days after Yuchenko's debriefing, the CIA finally shared its suspicions with the FBI, who immediately put surveillance on Howard's home. But Howard had been well-trained by the CIA and quickly picked up that he was being tailed. He probably picked up air surveillance within a, two or three days of it being instituted. Parker decided to confront Howard directly. He telephoned him to come to the Hilton Hotel to answer some questions. He declined to, to answer any of the questions uh, <clears throat> that uh, were put to him and denied any involvement whatsoever with any other uh, foreign intelligence service. That Friday, Howard went home to plot his escape. Even though Howard's wife, Mary, later claimed she hadn't known of her husband's spying, she helped him escape. Together, they jerry-rigged a dummy made with a broom, wig, and old clothes. Placing it on the floor of the front passenger seat, they drove off to dinner. The 
plan? After dinner, driving back in the dark, Mary made a sharp turn. Howard rolled out of the car, and Mary put the dummy in his place. And when Mary returned home, FBI agents monitoring their comings and goings on video saw two silhouettes enter the garage. It worked like a charm. I do think if the FBI had been told the truth by the CIA in the early 1980s, Howard could have been stopped. Uh, but the CIA didn't want to tell the FBI how they had botched the recruitment of Howard, the training of Howard. Howard made his way to Latin America, then Europe, and finally Moscow, where the KGB welcomed him with open arms in late June of 1986. Shortly after, he appeared on Soviet television to tell his side of the story. Howard has lived in Russia since 1986. His wife Mary didn't join him and they were divorced in 2000. Howard married a Czech woman and lives in Adasha, provided by the Russians with a housekeeper and gardener. A man who betrays his country and gives away secrets uh, and he virtually closed down the Moscow station of the CIA. Uh, it becomes hard to argue that he really had no quarrel with his country, but that's how he feels, that somehow his fight was with the agency and not with America. And in one of history's strange ironies, Howard lives in the same country as the man who helped identify him to the CIA and FBI, Vitaly Yurchenko. Only three months after defecting to the United States, Yurchenko did an about-face and returned to Russia. He claimed he had been drugged and kidnapped by American agents. The KGB welcomed him back as a great PR coup, even though the KGB knew the real reason for Yurchenko's return. He hadn't been able to rekindle his love affair with the wife of the Soviet ambassador in Canada. But before Yuchenko returned to Russia, he had told his FBI and CIA debriefers about yet another spy within the U.S. intelligence community, a spy who had access to highly classified information from the most secretive agency of all, the National Security Agency. Before Vitaly Yurchenko, the ping-pong defector, returned to Russia in 1985, he gave the FBI clues to a second spy. This spy was compromising intelligence operations of the National Security Agency. The NSA is the government's largest intelligence gathering agency, and so secretive that for years, the government didn't even admit it existed. Insiders would say NSA stood for no such agency. The U.S. government gets actually very little intelligence from human spies uh, run from the CIA. Most of it comes from electronic eavesdropping, code breaking, and other activities done by the National Security Agency. Yurchenko said the Americans selling NSA secrets to the Soviets had the code name Mr. Long. He had met him once, but did not know his real name. Hello, sir. Uh, yes. The FBI went into its archives. I, uh, I am in with the United States government. And found a wiretap of the Soviet embassy in 1980 with the voice of an American requesting a meeting. I have some information to discuss with you and to give to you. What, 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 what I, um, I think it would be better not to discuss it on the phone. NSA personnel quickly identified the voice as that of a former employee, Ronald Pelton. I can be there in two minutes. Okay. He had a very sensitive job. He knew where a lot of the NSA's uh, most sensitive eavesdropping activities were taking place in Russia. Felton had worked for the NSA for 14 years. Two months earlier, he had declared bankruptcy and quit the agency. At 38, $64,000 in debt and struggling to support his wife and four children on his $24,500 a year salary, he thought he could earn more in the private sector. He found a job selling yachts. But in his new job, he was actually making less than he had at the NSA. 
On January 14, 1980, still desperate for cash, he placed a call to the Soviet embassy. What Pelton gave away was one of NSA's biggest secrets. It was uh, codenamed Ivy Bells, involving tapping an undersea cable in the Sea of Okutsk. The underwater cable connected important Russian military bases and missile testing ranges. Ivy Bells gave the U.S. an inside track on Soviet military strategy. They had a submarine go to the very bottom of the sea, and then they had divers go out of the submarine holding what looked like jumper cables, basically, and they attached these cables to the Soviet undersea communications cable using um, tape recorders on board the submarine, eavesdrop on those communications. It was one of the most uh, far-ranging and successful operations in NSA's history. Pelton had blown this $1 billion reconnaissance operation out of the water. For five years, from 1980 to 1985, Pelton revealed secret operations to the Russians. When the NSA positively identified him, the FBI put him on 24-hour surveillance and installed wiretaps. They overheard he was planning a trip to Vienna. Fearing he might defect, like Edward Lee Howard, they called Pelton up on another pretext, asking for his help. I told him that we were FBI agents and this was a national security matter and we needed his assistance in clearing up some questions. They told Pelton to meet them at the Annapolis Hilton, where they had set up a room for the interrogation. As soon as he arrived, they started to grill him. After a day and night of hard questioning, Pelton finally broke and confessed. He said that uh, when, when you're broken and your family's uh, without any money and desperate, you do desperate things. Unlike John Walker, during Pelton's five years of spying, he received only $37,000 from the Soviets. Stay on the right. Stay on the right. Stay on the right. But he would end up getting an even harsher sentence than Walker, three life terms plus 10 years. Much of Pelton's damage to national security was classified and never talked about publicly, but the severe sentence he received reveals the depth and scope of the secrets he told. 1985, an astonishing year in the annals of espionage. Four moles within four different agencies, the FBI, the CIA, Naval Intelligence, and the NSA, willing to betray their country for money, sex, and revenge. The good news was that they had finally been caught and brought to justice. The bad news was the damage they caused and the lives lost because of what they did. And 1985 was the very same year that two of America's most infamous traitors, Aldrich Ames and Robert Hansen, were just beginning to spy for the Soviet Union. In 1985, the FBI arrested seven Americans for leaking intelligence secrets to the Soviets. Most of them received life sentences. But anyone who thought this put an end to such high-level treason was very wrong. You would think, because it was a year of spy, because we caught people, would have deterred people from going into spying. I think it has exactly the opposite effect. By 1985, the United States and Soviet Union had been involved in a clandestine chess game of spy against spy for almost 40 years. And during decades of deceit, fueled by threats of nuclear war, there would be no checkmate, just escalating military expenditures. But the Soviet political landscape underwent a seismic shift in 1985, when 54-year-old Mikhail Gorbachev came to power. He introduced political and economic reforms and a policy of glasnost, or openness, towards the West. This welcome thaw in the Cold War rapidly led to a meltdown of the Soviet-dominated communist bloc. On November 9, 1989, the world watched as thousands of Germans, in a spontaneous explosion of emotion, began to dismantle the Berlin Wall. All of the problems of the Cold War, the big ones, 
were solved when the Berlin Wall came down, when Germany was unified. I think also there was a total rejection of the communist ideology at that time. It was clear that it had failed. Two years later, the Soviet Union itself began to crumble when three Soviet republics declared their independence from the Soviet Union, the Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. By the end of the year, Gorbachev renounced the Communist Party and, on December 25th, resigned his presidency. The next day, the Soviet Union was declared officially dead. Once the totalitarian control of the Communist Party was broken, and it was broken by Gorbachev, not by Western pressure, because the Cold War ended before the Soviet Union collapsed. Once that happened, they couldn't hold that a irrational system like that together anymore. However, even though the Soviet Union had collapsed, the new Russian Confederation continued spying on the United States and recruiting Americans willing to betray their country. Aldrich Ames, one of the most infamous traitors in American history, was a Soviet counterintelligence expert in the CIA. His father, Carlton, had also worked for the CIA in Burma, where Aldrich, or Rick as he was called, spent his teenage years. After graduating from George Washington University in 1967, Ames entered the CIA training program. Nine years later, he landed a choice post in America's spy capital, New York City. At the time, the CIA and FBI estimated there were over 300 Soviet spies working in Manhattan alone, most operating under diplomatic cover at the United Nations and the Russian consulate. Some of these Russians, disaffected with life in the Soviet Union, offered their services to the CIA and FBI as double agents. Ames became the CIA liaison to several of them. One was the highest ranking Soviet ever to spy for the CIA, Arkady Shevchenko, Under Secretary General of the United Nations. Ames was good at handling spies who had volunteered, but he wasn't very successful at recruiting new spies. Ames was considered bright, but lazy. He also had a drinking problem. One of the uh, fitness reviews for Ames, after he'd had really a dreadful uh, series of alcoholic uh, exploits, uh, was something like social drinker uh, who at times becomes overly enthusiastic. Well, he was so overly enthusiastic, uh, uh, he had to be taken home and didn't even recognize his own house on one occasion. However, the CIA never reprimanded Ames for his drinking. The CIA was always a fraternity, a secret brotherhood, a kind of a combination of Yale's secret skull and bones society and the post office. And within this fraternity, once you were in, you were in for life. In 1981, the CIA assigned Ames to Mexico City, considered a backwater post. If his CIA career had stalled, so had his marriage. His wife, Nancy, was a successful lobbyist in New York City and refused to move. Ames went to Mexico alone. It was a decisive turning point in his life one that would sow the seeds for his becoming one of America's most notorious spies. He went to Mexico and became involved with Rosario, who was there for uh, as a Colombian diplomat, and the rest is history. Rosario was an attractive, dark-haired, single woman, and they began a relationship. Eventually, Ames was in love. He divorced his wife. He married Rosario. Rosario Dupuy came from an aristocratic family that had fallen on difficult times. She was cultured and appreciated the finer things of life, and Ames tried to please her. But Ames could hardly afford luxury cars or fine art on his salary. He also had to pay alimony. And in 1983, when he was transferred back to CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, the cost of living was much higher than in Mexico. He soon found himself $50,000 in debt. Ames knew that crossing his desk 
were secrets that were priceless, that were, were worth uh, millions to the Russians. Ames was now head of the Soviet branch of the CIA's counterintelligence group. He looked around his little pastel office, and he looked at the information that he had, which included the identities of every Soviet secretly working for the CIA. And he said to himself, this would be worth a lot of money to Moscow. In early April of 1985, 44-year-old Aldrich Ames made a fateful decision. He called a diplomat at the Russian embassy, Sergei D. Chivakin, and invited him to lunch at the Mayflower Hotel. The die was cast. On the day of the lunch, Ames downed several martinis waiting for Chivakin. When the diplomat never showed up, Ames marched over to the Russian embassy and demanded to see Chivakin. Ames handed the Russian an envelope. Inside were the names of two KGB agents spying for the US. Lieutenant Colonel Valery F. Martinov and Major Sergei M. Motorin. They work right there at the Russian embassy. Ames said he had more information to give the Soviets and demanded $50,000. A week later, he and Chevakin met for lunch at Chadwick's, a popular Georgetown pub. After lunch, Javakin leaned over and gave Ames a package, saying, here are some press releases I think you'll find interesting. When he got into his car, Ames reached down into the package and found a tightly wrapped stack of $100 bills, $50,000 worth. He knew that as long as he continued providing information to the KGB, that they would continue to pay him because for them to have someone not only inside the CIA but inside the Soviet counterintelligence part of the CIA was like a dream come true or like the kid in the candy store. Ames had tapped into a gold mine and there would be no turning back. On June 13th, 1985, Rick Ames met for the second time with his Russian contact, Sergei Chevagin. Ames gave him five pounds of secret documents. He'd walk right out of the CIA with it. No one had searched the bag and said, oh, are those secrets you're carrying there, Rick? And he went over to Georgetown and uh, had lunch. And in the course of the lunch, he handed over the bag to his Soviet contact. And that was it. And the money kept flowing, millions. On that one day, in an extraordinary act of betrayal, Ames compromised all human intelligence operations in Moscow. He gave Chevakin the names of every Russian in Moscow spying for the US, now estimated to be about two dozen people. Within months, the KGB would arrest and execute 10 people, including Martinov and Motorin, the men at the Russian embassy whom Ames had exposed in his first meeting. Those losses were severe. Your ability to attract other people has to be in the light of your track record of protecting them. People who come to you expect to be protected. They do not expect to be exposed. Uh, they expect your, their identity to be kept as close held as possible. And if you lose that reputation, you lose some of your ability to collect information. Those who weren't executed were sent to gulags in Siberia such as Vladimir Potashov, a military analyst and missile expert who had been sharing secrets with the U.S. that would prove vital in disarmament talks. In 1986, Potashov was arrested by the KGB. I was picked up on the street, uh, immediately transferred into the car. I was taken to the main KGB prison, Lefortovo, and then three KGB chairman deputies were interrogating me the whole night long. After Potashoff was questioned for over 100 days and nights, he was sentenced to 13 years in one of the most notorious prisons in Siberia, Perm 35. In this frigid wasteland, he lost all his teeth and was reduced to 95 pounds. It was always hunger, and hunger was not only physical, but emotional, um, but every Everything you saw there was uh, gray or white and black and white in winter. It was a cold. Our only dress 
which was a short jacket. When Ames gave up names to the KGB, he knew what their fate would be. One of the things that Ames did somewhere along the line, pretty early on, he mentally changed sides in the Cold War. He went over to the other side. And once he had done that, he thought, I think perhaps, well, I'm going to show them that I can be the best spy ever. You know, having, having crossed this line, why not give them everything? Of course, he still risked getting caught. In May of 1986, Ames was due for a lie detector test, required every five years. Ames' Russian handler, Chevakin, told him to get a good night's sleep and develop a rapport with the examiner. Ames passed his polygraph. He wouldn't be tested again for another five years. In 1986, Ames was assigned to a prestigious overseas post, Soviet branch chief of the CIA station in Rome, located in the American embassy. Meanwhile, in his secret life, he continued giving up intelligence secrets to his new Russian handler. With his growing affluence, he indulged his taste for stylish Italian suits and expensive foreign cars. Ames and Rosario also celebrated the birth of their son, Paul. In Rome, the money kept pouring in. Ames flew to Zurich and opened up two Swiss bank accounts and deposited, over time, more than one million dollars. Eventually, the Russians gave or promised Ames 4.6 million dollars. That's a lot of money, especially for a civil servant, for anybody. But to the Soviets, the information Ames provided was definitely worth the money. One of the spies he revealed was Dmitry Polyakov, codename Top Hat. For 18 years, he had provided the U.S. with data on Soviet strategic missiles, nuclear strategy, and chemical and biological warfare. In 1980, he retired to a dacha outside Moscow. Then, in 1988, he got a call from the KGB. They say that he dressed in his military uniform with all of his medals and then proudly marched off to his doom. Since 1986, the CIA and FBI had begun to realize that their spies in the Soviet Union were being rounded up and killed or were sent to prison. Initially, they blamed former CIA agent Edward Lee Howard, who had defected to the Soviet Union in 1985. For years, the CIA thought maybe Howard is the cause of this disaster, but then they realized there's no way he could have known the names of all these agents. Uh, between Ames and Howard, uh, the entire stable of Soviet military and intelligence and scientific and technical people who were risking their lives to work for this country died. They were all wiped out. In 1989, when Ames returned to work at CIA headquarters, he flaunted his new wealth. He bought a new Jaguar and paid cash for a half a million dollar house in Arlington, Virginia. Rick Ames was almost a classic example of a conspicuous consumption spy. He uh, had Italian suits, he had his uh, teeth fixed. Uh, he began to live higher. He bought a house with half a million dollars in cash when he came back to the United States, which was unusual. Uh, talk to any real estate agent, not many people plunk down that much money. They go to a bank and get a mortgage. And you would say, well, these would be things that would attract attention, wouldn't it? When old friends inquired about his lavish lifestyle, he'd led them to believe that his wife's Colombian parents were wealthy. The CIA never questioned him. By December of 1991, the Soviet Union had disintegrated. Under the new Russian state, the KGB became the SVR, or Foreign Intelligence Service. Ames remained on the Russians' payroll and continued to be paid handsomely. Ames was recruited during the Soviet Union, and no country is going to give up that kind of asset. I mean, would we have if we had had those because the Soviet Union collapsed? No, of course not. You're not going to betray the person who's been working for you. As for the Soviet spies Ames had betrayed, the CIA refused to consider that one of their own agents might be responsible. They would not believe that the cause could be a mole. It had to be a broken code. 
they told themselves. It had to be a bug. It had to be a wiretap. It had to be some snafu in the communication system of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Not one of us. It couldn't be one of us. By 1991, when Ames had been spying for six years, Paul Redmond became the CIA's deputy chief of counterintelligence. Paul Redmond revived the mole hunt. It hadn't been getting very far. Redmond believed there was a traitor inside the agency, and he was determined to find him. But he had no illusions. It would be a tough job. Determined to find the mole within the CIA, Deputy Chief of Counterintelligence, Paul Redmond, put together a special team of four agents. They started with close to 200 possible candidates who had known something about the Russians who were executed. We narrowed the list down to about 20. The criteria, which were very informal, were there were a couple of people who went away mad, who had some access, there were some people who had had polygraph problems. Ames was on the list because of the business of uh, Diana Worthen coming in saying that he had much more money after he came back from Rome. Diana Worthen had worked with Ames in Mexico City and was now on Redmond's team of investigators. Another agent on the team, Sandy Grimes, after months of painstaking work, found the critical clue that led directly to Rick Ames. The clue was matching Ames' bank deposit slips with the dates of his lunches with his Soviet contact, Chevakin, in 1985. We had just received records from one of the banks Rick had. And Dan is reading these things off, and I'm entering them in the, in the computer. And my god, it was unbelievable. On 17 May, Rick would have, had reported having had a lunch with um, his Soviet contact, Chuvakin. 18 May, there's a deposit into his checking account for $9,000. I remember Sandy coming in to see me and standing in the doorway saying, we got the son of a bitch. And that's essentially the analysis in a nutshell as to how we came to the conclusion that Rick Ames was probably the spy. Redmond believed they had found their mole and notified the FBI. In May 1993, while Ames and his family were on vacation in Miami, the FBI bugged his house. We made an entry into Ames' house for the purpose of conducting a search and uh, installing microphones. And of course we had to do it right under the noses of his neighbors. And uh, we did it in the dead of night. We sent a very small team in. They searched his computers and uh, searched for documents. We also uh, put a beacon on his car to help with the surveillance. To do that, Weiser's team set up a ruse. Ames was asked to drive his CIA boss to FBI headquarters for a counter-narcotics meeting. Ames parked his car at FBI headquarters and we simply moved it uh, down below the street level to a garage down there and uh, put the beacon in while he was briefing FBI officials upstairs. Ames was now being tailed around the clock. On a September morning in 1993, Ames left his house and put a chalk mark on a mailbox at the corner of 37th and R Streets in Georgetown, a signal that he would be making a drop to his Soviet contact later in the day. But that afternoon, when Ames left work to make the drop, the car beacon failed and the FBI lost him. That day became known as Black Thursday. Black Thursday was a very low point for us and for me personally. Um, and uh, fortunately, it wasn't long after that that we uh, had a very important success. Weiser's surveillance team had worked out a plan of picking up Ames' trash while he slept. They perfected this to the point where within 11 to 15 seconds, they could drive up, pull the trash can into the van, uh, put a replacement can out, and drive away without being detected. At a separate site, they would uh, go through the trash, and uh, later they switched them back so that Ames's trash was there when he went out in the morning. 
what they found that night in the garbage would ultimately become critical evidence against Ames. That note, uh, which was really uh, on a piece of paper only this big, arranged for a meeting in Bogota, Colombia later that fall. When Ames traveled to Bogota to make contact with the Soviet handler, the FBI followed. But Ames got the time wrong and missed making contact. I was walking up and down, wondering what had happened to my KGB contact, who had been there an hour earlier. I was reasonably alert, but I didn't see the surveillance. And I suppose it was frustrating for the FBI because they were scared to death of me seeing surveillance. So they had to stay way back. As a result, they never saw me doing anything. They had no evidence of any operational activity on my part. Catching him in the act would have been the strongest evidence of Ames' guilt. But the FBI had already found incriminating evidence on his computer. And by January of 1994, time was running out. Ames was scheduled for a CIA counter-narcotics meeting in Moscow. The FBI feared if he learned of their surveillance, he would take that opportunity to defect, like Edward Lee Howard. They had only one choice, to move fast. On February 21st, 1994, the President's Day holiday, the FBI had Ames' boss, David Edgar, phone Rick and ask him to come into the office regarding his Moscow trip. The FBI wasn't about to let him get on that plane and do an Edward Lee Howard. So they intercepted his car only a couple of blocks from his house in Northern Virginia and arrested him. Ames had spied for the Soviets for nine years and made $2.7 million dollars with another million and change put aside in an escrow account in Moscow. At his arrest, as the FBI put him in the car, he had a hard time accepting that his lucrative double life was ending. In the car, being driven to a, a place where he was questioned, uh, he was overheard saying, think, 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 as though he might still somehow be able to get out of this fix he was in. Presented with the evidence gathered against him, Ames made a deal. He pled guilty so that his wife, Rosario, would get a reduced sentence. It was apparent from the wiretaps that she had known about his spying. Rosario Ames received a five-year sentence. On April 28, 1994, Aldrich Ames, 53, was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. He took an objective view of this. Uh, he said at the time, uh, you know, this is uh, the business of espionage. Uh, they took their chances, I took my chances. I think he used that expression. Aldrich Ames is serving his time at the Allenwood Federal Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. I spent about eight hours interviewing uh, Aldrich Ames uh, in prison uh, in 1994. What's he like? Uh, he's arrogant. He is uh, unctuous, oily, in a kind of a sleazy, charming way, like a snake. He's smart, uh, but uh, he disguised that fact by being drunk for most of his career. He is unrepentant. And for those he betrayed, even Ames' arrest can never bring back their lost years. What I would say uh, to him in prison, in his prison, um, I would say uh, that repentance or uh, his confession uh, as a human being is not sufficient. As a result of the Ames case, after years of animosity and distrust, a joint FBI-CIA team was formed to investigate future espionage cases. With more cooperation between the CIA and FBI and the end of the Cold War, many in government thought the worst days of spying were over until FBI agent Robert Hansen proved what a dangerous assumption that could be. Robert Hansen, a senior counterintelligence analyst with the FBI, may turn out to be the most treacherous and destructive spy of the past century. Hansen spied for the Russians on and off for 20 years, 
even through the transition from the Soviet Union to the new Russian state. The FBI arrested Hansen on February 18, 2001, as he made a delivery to the Russians at Foxstone Park near his home in Vienna, Virginia. Earlier in the day, he had left a signal for the Russians, a strip of white adhesive tape on the park sign. As arranged, he drove back to the park later in the afternoon, walked over the small wooden footbridge, and placed a package of secret documents underneath. The FBI had him under surveillance and moved in. He didn't say a word, not a single word, but one FBI um, agent told me that his shoulders slumped and he just sort of went limp because he knew it was just over. The FBI is still assessing the extent of the damage done by Hansen. But what is now known is frightening, especially in light of the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. Hansen had revealed to the Russians one of the US government's most highly guarded secrets, the continuity of government, or doomsday plan. That is our ultimate disaster survival plan. This is what you do at time of attack. Attack on the World Trade Center, you saw that go into action. Where did the president go? Where did the leadership go? Where did the intelligence community go? You heard about the fact that the CIA left the building. Well, they didn't go out of business. They relocated. Where? That's the secret. Well, that whole uh, ability to respond in time of a disaster is one of the greatest secrets that any government has. Hansen had also revealed sensitive satellite operations as well as a $250 million tunnel the U.S. had built in 1985 under the Russian embassy in Washington, D.C. The tunnel, loaded with sophisticated eavesdropping equipment, became worthless overnight. When I look at, at Bob and I try to figure out what's motivating him to do all this, uh, the, the thing that keeps crossing my mind is ambition. This is not money, it's not revenge, this is about being the best spy that there ever was in history against the United States for the Soviet Union. Hansen joined the FBI in 1976. Two years later, when he worked in New York City, he began his spying activities. In the name of the Father. He claims he approached the Soviets because he needed money to pay for his kids' parochial school tuitions. His wife, Bonnie, found out and confronted him. She catches him counting out the money. Well, she literally freaks. She's very upset, and she says, you've got to give it back. You, I mean, you, you, you can't do this. He goes to a priest, and the priest says, OK, here's what you're going to do. Don't do it anymore. Donate the money to Mother Teresa, and all will be forgotten. And that's what happened. But seven years later, in 1985, Hansen started spying again. He was not a happy spy. Dr. Alan Solarian, who spent several hours with Hansen in prison after his arrest, thinks Hansen returned to spying for reasons that had little to do with money. Internal demons, because he was fighting other battles internally, psychologically. His biggest problem was not spying. His biggest problem were other psychological issues. Robert Hansen is an enigma a man who led two completely separate lives, each constantly at war with the other. He said in the course of our discussions that, uh, that this whole activity was sort of like a Jekyll and Hyde uh, situation, where the bad guy took over at times. It seems like he had a bifurcated personality, almost a split personality, where one side of him could be completely church-going, uh, moral and um, uh, patriotic, and the other side of him can be the uh, mirror image, the uh, person who doesn't care that he's getting other people killed. Unlike Ames, who flaunted his wealth, Hansen did everything he could to hide the millions he was making from the Russians. At the time he was arrested, he was living with his wife, Bonnie, and six children in a modest middle-class community in Vienna, Virginia. His family, friends and neighbors thought him the epitome of an upright and moral man. It's just boggles the mind that Bob Hansen, on one hand, could rail against communism, say it's the worst thing in the world, 
be so patriotic, always espoused conservative moral values. On the other hand, of course, he's delivering material to the most sensitive material, nuclear materials, the, the, the strongest material he had, to communism. Hansen seemed more at home in a world of extremes. A convert to Catholicism, he attended daily mass and became a member of the ultra-conservative Catholic group Opus Dei. But at the same time, the conservative, moral-minded Hansen was spending thousands of dollars on a stripper, Priscilla Gailey, who he had met in 1989 at a Washington, D.C. striptease joint called Joanna's 1819 Club. This is Victoria. She claimed they never had a sexual relationship, even though Hansen bought her a Mercedes, a diamond and emerald necklace, and took her on a trip to Hong Kong. He wanted me to go to a priest and confess. I guess he thought I had some deep, dark, secret sins, maybe, that I needed to get off my chest to change my life. He certainly gave more money to Priscilla Sue Gailey than he ever gave to Opus Dei, which shows you how twisted his mind became. Hansen's twisted behavior became even more apparent when investigators learned that he had sent naked pictures of his wife, Bonnie, to his best friend, Jack Hoshauer, and he installed a closed-circuit television camera in his bedroom so that Jack could view the Hansen's lovemaking when he visited their home. Hansen also created an adult website, writing erotic stories using his own name and Bonnie's. Hansen would quit spying again in 1991 and stay dormant for eight years. But in 1999, he resumed spying once again. He needed a thrill, he needed a rush. Maybe the $600,000 that he had gotten had run out. And seven years had gone by and his name had never come up. He had checked the computers of the FBI. No one seemed to be looking for him. No one seems to be suspecting him. So why not start again? Hansen seemed driven by a compulsion that went far deeper than money and would send him back to his secret life of spying. Some clues to Hansen's complex personality would come to light as investigators started looking into his past. The roots of Hansen's spying may go back to his family roots. As an only child, he idolized his father, a Chicago policeman. But he never lived up to his father's expectations. Bob Hansen's father, I, I think we're finding, is turning out to be quite a brute, who really was treated Bob very shamelessly. Bob, who was a high school um, a science guy who was not a good athlete. His father is a Chicago police, big, tough guy. And Bob is not the kind of son he wants. He's the only son he has. All his life, Robert Hansen was an outsider. Some people have called Bob Hansen a geek. He was always a loner, a little bit strange. In 1966, Hansen graduated from Knox College near Chicago. He went on to study dentistry at Northwestern University. There, a fellow dental student, Robert Lauren, remembers Hansen being a bit eccentric. Bob dressed as weirdly as anyone could have at Northwestern Dental School because he wore all the time a black suit, usually a wool suit, I think, a white polyester shirt, and a black and blue or black and red rep stripe tie. Invariably, the same outfit, even under his gowns when we were dissecting cadavers, even under his gowns when we were doing really very dirty lab work. He also recalls Hansen's obsession with a book on Kim Philby, the famous British traitor who spied for the Soviet Union during and after World War II. And when I saw the pictures of Bob Hansen um, on the cover of a magazine, my mind immediately went to, the, went to the Philby book because that wonderful smile of his, those great white big rectangular teeth of his that I remembered when he was smiling with what could be done and what you could get away with, something like what Kim Philby did. And then when I saw his head, it's like 30 years later, it was like, oh my God, <laughs> he really did it. 
Hansen dropped out of dental school after two years and followed in his father's footsteps, joining the Chicago police force. If he seemed a bit strange in dental school, he was considered the perfect candidate for the police elite C5 undercover team. He was exceptionally bright. You know, he looked to be an honest, hardworking, bright policeman who came to me with excellent recommendations and excellent credentials. After three years with C5, Hansen joined the FBI in 1976. Ernie Rizzo, a fellow undercover cop, believes even back then he had become addicted to the rush of an undercover life. I think somewhere along the line he went over the edge from the normal high and just completely lost it. But I, I can understand where it's, it's a high. And when you're working undercover all your life, you, you just see how far you can go. It's like Michael Jordan shooting baskets. You know, how many baskets can you shoot? Uh, I can't give this up. I'll come back out of retirement five times just to prove I can still do it. Same mentality. So spying was that kind of complication for Bob Hansen. And he knew that it was destructive, it was horrible, but it was giving him temporary relief from the inner pain that he was experiencing. Hansen's career as a spy began to unravel during millennium year 2000. A former KGB agent, whose name remains classified, turned over Hansen's file to the FBI. Bob Hansen made one huge mistake. Every time he delivered and made drops to the Russians, he wrapped it in a plastic bag. He probably thought, oh, well, they'll throw away the garbage bag and just keep the documents. Oh, no, the Russians, they kept the, the garbage bags, and his fingerprints was on the garbage bags. After his arrest, and only weeks before his scheduled retirement, 57-year-old Robert Hansen was indicted on 21 counts of espionage. The government dropped its attempts to get the death penalty when Hansen agreed to tell all in exchange for his wife and children getting his pension. In return, the government agreed to life imprisonment without parole. When Hansen was captured, arrested in the United States. Someone called me and said, what a coup. I said, wrong. The coup was the Russians. They had Ames and they had Hansen. But ironically, it's the Russians who can be credited with helping uncover American traitors. Since 1985, former KGB agents have tipped off their American counterparts. That the American spy agencies were unable to find spies themselves was a subject of criticism by Congress. Makes you wonder, has anybody ever fired out at that place? Seriously, that was my question, and that's going to be my question of uh, the uh, director tomorrow when he comes up here. What do you have to do to be fired? President Bill Clinton, before leaving office, issued a directive establishing a new office to coordinate the different counterintelligence agencies in the hopes of identifying spies sooner. We realized that we weren't sharing intelligence, we weren't working together, we weren't uh, cooperating. And the more spies we had, the more Congress in particular was saying, hey, there's a problem here. And we don't want to stop it after the fact, we want to start, stop it before it happens. In the aftermath of the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon, it's obvious that temptations are greater than ever today for would-be spies. Rogue states, terrorists, and even allies are all vying for American intelligence, both military and technological. One of the best analogies I ever heard came from Jim Woolsey, the former DCI. We slayed the dragon, and as we cut him open, a thousand poisonous snakes fell out. And that's exactly what we're faced with today. Since the uh, early, late 80s and the early 90s, the numbers of countries and numbers of non-state actors, as we say, that have become um, interested in the United States and its technology, its economy, its academia, uh, has risen exponentially. Uh, and we are faced with uh, one of the biggest challenges in our history. And former KGB general Oleg Kalugin believes it would still be wise to keep an eye on our old adversary. Russians have preserved imperial mentality. 
As a nation, they feel humiliated. Uh, people who served in the KGB, in the party uh, hierarchy, and even uh, thousands and maybe millions of ordinary people who lost faith in the future because of the impoverishment and dismemberment of the former USSR. Uh, these people feel nostalgic about the old days and they want to restore the old great Russia. Even today, for some, money, sex, and revenge can overcome patriotism. And it's likely that spying will continue to be the second oldest profession. You'd have to say that with Ames operating the way he did for a decade, with Hansen at the FBI for over a decade, with the Walkers penetrating the most sensitive secrets of all for over 15 years, I don't think you could say with any assurance that we've gotten everyone, which is why they call this business the wilderness of mirrors. After Robert Hansen was finally caught, an independent commission headed by former FBI director William Webster was asked to investigate how Hansen had escaped detection for so long. Hansen claimed that any file clerk could download classified material from the FBI's computerized case system and simply carry it out the front door. The spy called FBI's internal security pathetic. The commission agreed with him. For the History Channel, I'm Roger Mudd. Thanks for watching.